Hello and welcome once again to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legendino Tim Vickery, uh, the oracle of South American football, as always with us and dialing in from Rio today, Tim, as always. Yes, uh, and uh, we're going to go all the way back to when the world was young and you used to say live and let live. June the 22nd, 1974, with the aid of a special guest. Indeed, and our special guest has joined us before. So welcome back. Hey, Dawson. Hey, Tim. Um, yeah, good. Glad to be back. I'm glad you um, thought of me, thought well enough of me to bring me back on. Um, or maybe I just got lost on the way out. I, I liken it to, um, you ever been to the clubs Oceana back in the day? You know, when they had all the wow, multiple rooms back. and you try and get, you try and leave, but then there's so many rooms and so many twists and turns and you end up just coming back to your mates, even though you intended to leave about half hour ago. Maybe that's me on this podcast. I've intended to leave and just got stuck on the way out and here I am still. It, but it's and more it's, like that is the voice of Ibrahim Mustafa. <laughs> who, uh, we, we, we didn't introduce, that was a bit rude of us. We didn't introduce. Oh, sorry, yeah. Name. Just that's like rambling, rattling on about nothing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's more like Hotel California when you come onto this podcast, you know. It's more Can't like, leave. yeah, you I'm can check allowed. in. You can check <laughs> in, but you can never leave. Now, it's a real pleasure having you back, actually, because um, uh, the last time you were on and, you know, you're quickly becoming our go-to person with regards to African football. Last time you were on, you really uh, did such a great job in introducing us to a lot of the challenges that African football goes through. None more so, perhaps, than in a World Cup. <laughs> and for contemporary African teams, the World Cup where it all started was 1974. Would you agree, Tim? Well, it's the first sub-Saharan African team is Zaire in that World Cup. So it, it's, a, it's a momentous occasion. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see what the, the, the African perspective would be on what happened to, to Zaire in, in, in that World Cup. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. This is, we're talking about the third game. We're focusing on the third game that they played. Um, they debuted against Scotland. Uh, and uh, they lost that one 2 0 which the Scots would come to rege- would, would come to uh, to uh, repent a little bit. They would regret because this was a group that all went down to goal difference, and it didn't include Zaire because Zaire the second game they lost nine nil to Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, the one that you've chosen to focus on is the third game against Brazil. The piggy in the middle, three uh, nil. Um, okay, so let's talk about this particular match. Do you want to put it into context, though? I, I don't know if you're able to put that into context, that group. Um, Scotland, Brazil and Yugoslavia, Tim. Brazil must have thought, you know, this is a free pass. We've got one hand on the World Cup, uh, to paraphrase yeah. A, yeah. A, a, a subsequent coach, uh, Luis Felipe Scolari. We have got one hand on the World Cup. Because Zaire, that's a pushover. And uh, it ended up being very, very nervy. And Brazil, of course, are the reigning champions. They don't have Pelé. They don't have... They suffer a few injuries. They don't have Carlos Alberto, the captain from from 70. They don't have Tostão. They don't have Clodoaldo. Uh, They don't have Gerson. So they've lost some key players, but they think they've got some other great players as well. And they go into the World Cup thinking that they are right up there with a chance of, of retaining their, their title. Scotland, they don't know much about. They've played Scotland in a mini World Cup two years earlier, which is something that I hope we'll get to during the course of this discussion, because there's a lot of geopolitics swirling around football at this, at this moment. Yugoslavia hadn't gone to the, 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 the previous World Cup but were seen as, as, as a reasonable force. And the first game was a bit of a shock because Brazil could only draw nil-nil. And then the second game, they can only draw nil-nil against Scotland. So it's all going to come down to goal difference. They've got to get three. And At then, least. Well, th- three will do it because if, if Scotland and Yugoslavia draw 
then the three that they've scored against that they score against Zaire will take them past Scotland on goal difference. If there's a winner in Scotland and Yugoslavia, Brazil will 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 be ahead of the winners. So Brazil take the field knowing that they've got to score three goals against the first sub-Saharan African team to make it to a World Cup. And this, I think, is a massive story in itself. Why did it take so long? Why was, why was African football relegated and left out of the loop? And that, for me, is the story of the second game against Yugoslavia. And I, I managed to see a few years ago when I came back to England, someone lent me a tape of Brazil Zaire. And I remember watching the Scotland game and the, I was only just turned nine at the time and thinking, they're not bad, you know, they're not bad, Zaire. And mm. I watched the Brazil game and they can play. But what they couldn't do was defend against crosses. And that's why Yugoslavia beat them 9-0. I don't think that they, that it was a style of football. I'm not sure they'd come up against. And that's not their fault because African football has been left out of the loop, hasn't it? And here, if you just indulge me for a minute, you've got to go back to the whole geopolitics of FIFA. FIFA gets going early 20th century with a revolutionary concept, which is one member, one vote. It's revolutionary. This is before, it's before the United Nations. It's before the League of Nations. Why is this done? Because at this point, the competitor, the start of the 20th century, the competitor for global governance of the game is the English FA, which is not even English FA, it's just the FA, as if there's no others. Quite a few other associations around the world, in South America, for example, they were affiliated to the FA. So the FA is like the owner of the spectacle. So FIFA, it's formed by some of the other Western European football associations and the way that they entice the other countries is to say one country one country one vote so you can have a say it's not all down to the english and they do a little stitch up they do a compromise which which lasts to this day where the control of the laws of the game is still in the hands of the british you know this thing called the international board who decide the rules of the game that's a compromise that comes from the early 20th century FIFA will, will uh, be able to take over from, from the English the control of the global game on the basis of one member, one vote. But just to show that, that, that we're on the level with you English who, who, who've spread the game, we'll, we'll give you some control over, over the laws. So that works all well and fine until you get into the post-colonial world. And then suddenly you've got all these new nations all over the place. And... God damn it, as Gil, Gil Scott Heron said, what first one wants freedom and the whole damn world wants freedom. That's a good, that is a good line from Gil Scott Heron. Brilliant. Let's bring Ibrahim into this conversation here because I think Tim has set it up really nicely, the backdrop to this. And a backdrop is needed, Ibrahim, because otherwise you're thinking, well, what's going on? You know, what am I watching in parts of this match? But uh, we'll come back. If you don't mind, I mean, if you answer it in whichever way you want. But I think Tim's question about why has it taken so long for an African team, sub-Saharan team, to get there to work up uh, until 1974 is worth answering within the context. But actually, the main question is, when Tim explained what the Brazil's intention was in this match to get at least three goals or to get three goals... What were what was at this time, from what you understand, Ibrahim, what was Zaire playing for? Because they played as if they still had something to play for. Okay, well, fundamentally, it's a huge, there's so much backdrop to this story that, you know, if you just allow me to of actually course. go through it, of course. Um, so from what Tim's talking about and just getting a sub-Saharan African team into the World Cup was a long, drawn-out ordeal, That obviously going back to the early days of the World Cup. And fundamentally, the qualifying was always a big issue because African teams fundamentally weren't guaranteed a place up until 1970. So the first editions of the World Cup, you never saw... Well, you saw Egypt qualified for 1934, played one game and went home. Uh, they lost to uh, Hungary in Italy. Um 
Uh, and after that, an, an African team just failed to qualify because of the complicated mechanisms of the qualification process, which often had multiple African teams facing off against each other to whittle it down to one team who would either have to go into a playoff against an Asian team and a winner of that would then have to play against one of the worst UEFA teams, which more often than not, well, all the, they'd constantly lose. Um, and up until um, 19, no, 1966, African teams fund, just boycotted qualification just on the basis of the fact that they weren't given a guaranteed place. And if this was obviously a terrible look for FIFA who had to sort of back down and ultimately compromise and say, right, African, Africa can have a guaranteed place from the 1970 World Cup onwards. And in part, partly because of um, uh, Jao, Jao Havelanche, who is eventually became FIFA president, he it was one of his ways of winning votes was to go to Africa and say, you know, we're going to give you these World Cup places. We're going to get Pele to come with Brazil or Santos to come and tour Africa, which he did. And, you know, just getting the Africans on side. And um, yeah, and obviously that led to him becoming the president of FIFA. But anyway, from 1970 onwards, Africa had a guaranteed place, which would obviously increase over time. Um, 1970, it was Morocco. They qualified. Um, they went out in the group stages. But and, they led Germany for a while in their first game. Indeed, and yes. That, that just that game, I think, and Germany came back to win two one. Mm. But that just blew out of the water the FIFA argument that no, we can't have the Africans in because the standards, the standards will slip. Mm. Now, in in the course of the first game, that argument I think has gone. Yeah, absolutely. They they essentially shocked the world they were they weren't they weren't able to get the win against germany but to go a goal up against germany in that world cup was was everyone was everyone was shocked and with everyone thought sat back and thought hang on maybe these guys can play but then there's obviously this difference with um north africa and sub-saharan africa obviously france and their history with their north colonialism of north africa their colonizing sorry of north africa having basically a lot of Algerian born players playing in Ligue 1 for for years essentially so there was this idea that yeah if Africans were good at football it was going to be the North Africans and nobody really considered um, anything below the Sahara really so um, yeah so for Zaire they their history and them getting there is not really long and drawn out so if you allow me to provide a little slight history lesson first. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to it. Actually. Yeah. I'm so, really looking forward to this. So what we call, what we call now the democratic, the democratic Republic of Congo, which was formerly known as Zaire, um, is this massive landmass in the center of the African continent. Um, initially the coast was where a lot of slaves were taken across the Atlantic to America and the Americas. Um, it, it, during the obviously transatlantic slave trade, but inland there was a lot of fear of sort of like the set like the colonizers and the slave traders to go inland. So it was this really sort of unknown. It was real sort of heart of Africa, like that nobody knew about. That a was dark until continent. Well, yes, and um, <laughs> until um, a British explorer, and I'm going to say it in the well, Henry Morgan Stanley, you know, very much that kind of uh, of that kind of persona was he had dis discovered but he was there and he um on behalf of the belgian king leopold was there to sort of break bread with the african chiefs it, to sort of um, it was obviously quite it was not necessarily to be beat to make peace with them it was obviously to scout around and see what what, what this land had to offer and obviously there's ivory and rubber and everything and so he reports this back to leopold who Go back to the end of the 19th century. You have the Berlin Leopold, Conference. who, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt you, because you mentioned his name once now. Let's not forget this is the butcher of the Congo. This, this was it. the king that um, did unspeakable things. You have to read up on this because it will just make me sick to even hear it. Well, that was going to be my br my my briefest of uh, sort of summaries of that. So, um, at the Berlin Conference at the end of the nineteenth century, where all the European nations are sort of sat around and set and drew a map of Africa and just 
took a pen and just like, right, you have that. Yeah, you have that. You have this, you have that. And he, under the guise of humanitarian work, said, oh, I'll just have the middle bit there. I'll just have this plonk, this big bit of land in the middle, which he called the Congo Free State, which couldn't be a more ironic name because of everything you sort of alluded to there in terms of his brutality in sort of putting people to slave labour, to forced labour, to work and, um, you know... To maim them, to murder them. Well, this is the thing. During the course of the research, I mean, I've got this all in in the book, um, No Longer Naive, um, the book that I've written about this. And it's and um, there's a photo I came across in the process of my research where you see dismembered hands and feet. And you're sort of looking at these and thinking, oh, these this is obviously the horrific punishments that the um, the people were put were, were, were put through. But then you look at this photo um, I, saw, I mean, it's online. I found it somewhere, and you see that these hands and feet are actually very small, and they're and you realise the penny drops that these are actually children's hands and feet that he's like they've dismembered, and I think it it amounted to around ten to fifteen million, depending on which estimates you read, people who were killed that over the course of this horrific sort of time for this area of the world until sort of early early twentieth century was taken away and put in the hands of Belgium. So it was a Belgium, the Bel- it was not as br- not as brutal, but still under the colonial rule of the belt of Bel- the Belgian Congo. Um, independence eventually comes about in a- around 1960. I think it is 1960, possibly 59. And um, yeah, and the first demo- democratically elected president is uh, Patrice Lumumba. And yeah, he is assassinated within a year of being of in being in power um by a cia essentially cia backed american backed sort of coup essentially because they don't want sort of pad african independence you know they want to be able to still have the fast the control and they install uh joseph uh, mabutu as the um de facto leader slash dictator remember you know? mabutu uh, is probably implicated, more than likely implicated in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. Um, he was the army chief at the time in any case. Lumumba, for those who don't know, in my view, probably the greatest African leader. And uh, this was a time of the Cold War where the CIA, they couldn't care less if you were flying under the flag of Pan-Africanism that to them sounded like socialism, which to them sounded like communism, which to them was the enemy. So Patrice isn't Lumumba... It, isn't it more just divide and rule? Divide and rule, it and, is. Then, and then you can get the raw materials, which is surely what, what so much of this is all about. But, but he represented, Lumumba represented uh, more of a threat in, um, you see, the history that Ibrahim has given us, the reason why the Congo, part of the reason why the Congo was easily subjugated was because it was this huge, vast uh, conglomerate of nations. That's the real way to look at it. You know, when you talk of Native Americans in America, you know, what was the connection between uh, the Apache and the Cherokee? Probably no connection. The connection was the outsider, the intruder, who could divide and rule you in that context. But more dangerous for them is somebody who could get into your head. Patrice Lumumba's revolution was an intellectual revolution as much as anything else. And his danger was the danger of a leader. So it wasn't about dividing rules, just get rid of him, get rid of him, kill him and end it. And they succeeded in that respect because the person that took over, Mobuto, was willing to do whatever the, was willing to uh, keep his own people ignorant so that he could do the bidding of the West. That's my interpretation. And then literally following on from that, keep it by keeping people ignorant was to provide them with a successful football team. Ultimately, he by t- distracting the population by his kleptocratic rule, his changing of the constitution, all that sort of thing. But the, the, the people were distracted because you had the Zaire team. He changed the name of the country to Zaire, of course, as well. Um, 
and having this football team who were successful, they won the 1968 AFCON. Um, he put loads of money into them. And obviously they qualified for the 74 World Cup. A few months ahead of that, they won the 1974 AFCON. And they were an African powerhouse in football. You know, they were... Why, why, why was that? What did they have at that point that made them better than the Nigerias and the Ghanas and so on? I think financial backing is a big thing there. I mean, a lot of the other backing. countries, yeah, a lot of the countries were still coming out, coming out of um, colonial rule and trying to find their feet, like literally, uh, independently. And um, football wasn't necessarily top of the agenda for a lot of countries. It was just basically trying to stabilise. But I guess in Zaire, the idea was to, like I say, because he was this sort of autocratic leader, he just wanted to distract the people by, well, by thinking right right you know let's let's put us on the footballing map and let people well, think that this sport is making up that the country is this this is great through sport essentially do you know so. this was the very ultimate and first instance of sports washing mm. that's my view now that rumble in a jungle it's the yeah, same exactly the same exactly. process it happens the same year just exactly. months after the world cup yeah Tim, have, you, remember... have, you, have, have you seen the documentary about there's a documentary about it or the footing from the time i've got a, a mate who's obsessed with boxing and he used to force me to watch it again and again and again president mabuto in his asalat hat uh, and uh, <laughs> you know in 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 the time of the build up to the fight uh that they've uh, they've obviously been told to to show lots of kinshasa it's it's a, the idea of and uh, there are some modern you know some of the buildings are really modern and the, the, the poor tv announcer hasn't got a clue what they are so you know, it is large governmental building and here another large governmental <laughs> building in this very modern downtown kinshasa it's also fabulous because you've got david frost on co-commentary saying he is jimmy two times out of goodfellas he just says everything twice everything twice and here's a word from joe frazier and here's a word from joe frazier so it's it's a it's a fabulous watch but it, mm. it, it's i imagine from from what you're telling me ibrahim it the rumble of the jungle is part of this same process of use of western money perhaps mm. to, to to boost I, I wouldn't say it was western money no. I, I wouldn't no. say it was western money because congo's has got rich uh, reserves which mabutu exploited and um, used for his personal wealth i'm sorry Ibrahim, the question was directed <laughs> towards you no 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 that's absolutely true i mean i can't disagree with that they see yeah he um took the money from within the country kept kept his people poor but it's like hey look at this shiny football team hey look at this shiny boxing match and that was fundamentally yeah of course <laughs> yeah well, of course you know th this was part of sports washing though the the hats a distraction the hat and the dark glasses, you will know from South America, Tim, the military hunters there, they always announce themselves with a photograph where they're all wearing dark glasses, dark glasses looking very yeah. sinister and mysterious. Mobutu was no different. I mean, you study this guy's dictatorship, and he is the great dictator of Africa. There's nobody that was a greater dictator than him. He used his... Uh, his country's wealth as his personal wealth. See, when it comes to sports washing, we're all talking about Saudi Arabia now with regards to Newcastle uh, and everything else. This was Saudi Arabia, you could argue, well, they're sports washing for the international community uh, to not ostracize them and treat them as pariahs for murdering journalists in their embassies or whatever. They're doing it for the consumption of the rest of the world. Mobutu is doing this for his own people as well. Imagine if you're somebody in Kinshasa at the time, earning a dollar a day, barely able to feed your family, but you've got Cassius Clay coming down to, isn't that the perfect distraction for a, uh, a dictatorship? Then as hungry as you are, Muhammad Ali's in town. And next up, your national team is taking on Brazil. Brazil, your national team? Then it would seem to me as if you've got, you know, your, your, your worries are being washed away with all these symbols of the dictatorship. Yeah. And so, yeah, the team have arrived at the World Cup and they are 
African champion. So, you know, this is a, a considered a good team from within within Africa. And um, they have, the, uh, managing them, they have a Yugoslavian, uh, again, I'm going to apologise for butchering the pronunciation. There might be a few of these as we go on today. So, Bla- Blajoy Vid- Vidinic, I think, is the was the manager of the team. He had previously managed Morocco at the 1970 World Cup. And obviously, Mobutu's got wind of this and... Um, he lures him in to Zaire to be able to take control of them for the for the World Cup, um, and um, so yeah, they face Scotland in their first game, and you know, and ultimately Zaire as a team, they have a number of players who are within their obviously within their own nation and obviously within Africa considered star players because of you know they they're good at this time. Um, they, I was. I've, put this again put this all in the book there's a uh, Mayanga Maku who is nicknamed the Brazilian there's Buanga Tshemen Ch- who's nicknamed the Black Beckenbauer and um, oh, I like that yeah <laughs> and <laughs> and they have a uh, Mauba Ma- Mafila again apologies for the pronunciation he was nicknamed the Black the Black Sorcerer because these guys were with these were good at, the guys were good at football fundamentally and they had um Ndai Mulam- Mul- Mulamba who scored nine goals in the 1974 AFCON win. Uh, and no, no player has actually scored as many goals in an AFCON tournament since. And he still holds that record for nine goals in that tournament, just to show how good he was perceived beforehand. And um, yeah, so they show up in this game against Scotland. Scotland beforehand, they're managed by Willie Ormond, who turns around and says, if we can't beat these, but if we can't smash these, then we may as well pack up and go home kind of thing. Just that dismissive attitude that because nobody takes the sub-Saharan African team seriously. And yeah, Scotland scored twice in the first half, uh, Joe Jordan and Peter Lorimer, I believe, and they're expecting the floodgates to open, but it doesn't happen because Zaire actually put put in a good account of themselves. And um, yeah, that's it. and you think, okay, they've done all right there. They've got Yugoslavia next. And again, going back to me, remember I saying they had the manager who was from Yugoslavia. So there's all sorts of conspiracy talk about what is happening in this, in, in light of the nine nil result that you mentioned him. And did he, was he, did he set up his team to lose, to help his home country get through? But he didn't because the story is obviously that um, they were due uh, the bonus for qualifying for the world cup, the Zaire team. They would do money. The money that was being dished out by FIFA that goes to each team was obviously being held by one person who was obviously connected to Mobutu within the camp. It was one of these, they'd sent so many people as part of the camp to the World Cup, the team, plus a countless other people who are just nothing to do with the football team, but they're all connected to the government and various different parts. That's, yeah. that's Africa for you, you know. I mean, if I might just share a quick anecdote. Um, the last, the 2012 Olympics, uh, one of my cousins came over and uh, from Nigeria and he was, um, he wasn't even connected to the Nigerian Olympic Committee. And if he was, it was just, you know, very tenuously. But yeah, he came over like he was the president of the Nigerian Olympic Committee and was able to see as many events as he had, all the tickets, didn't give me a single one. Mm. Which is why I'm happy <laughs> to expose him on this podcast as somebody who had absolutely nothing mm. to do with Nigeria's Olympics and athletes. He was just on 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 one of these uh, perks for the boys, as yeah. it were, coming over to England. That's what you get paid um, mm. as well in African terms. Sometimes, shockingly, it's still yeah. going on. Well, there, yeah. So, yeah, obviously, going way way back, obviously, to this tournament in 1974, this is what happened. They had the, uh, this huge um, entourage following them, and the money that the players were due ne- duly never arrived. And they, the team called a meeting the night before the Yugoslavia game, and they were arguing and disputing with all these officials and saying, "Where's the money that we're due? We've played a game. We've come to the World Cup. We haven't disgraced ourselves. Where is our money?" And obviously, deep into the night, they're arguing. And then they wake up in the morning and the guy who was supposed to have the money has disappeared. He's gone. He has disappeared, probably gone back to Zaire. It's probably in Mobutu's safe now. And so these guys are just, they're dispirited. They're angry, frustrated. They haven't slept. They've been arguing all night. And then 
essentially they threw they throw the game against Yugoslavia. Of course, Tim, as you pointed out, the Yugoslavian tactics to keep putting in crosses was something they weren't they weren't au fait with. But ultimately, they didn't want to play. They went into that game saying, you know, we we've been humiliated by our own country people, so wait, let's turn around and humiliate them. And so they've gone into this game. And they've just not put in the effort. There's a deliberate, a, a pretty that somebody gets sent off for aiming a kick at the referee. So it is almost like they've stopped. And the goalkeeper is subbed off at three nil to bring on another goalkeeper. The, the the goalkeeper that was that started was five foot nine. The goalkeeper that was subbed on is five foot four. And you talk oh. about you talk about crosses coming in. <laughs> you know they oh were they goodness. hadn't they had no chance. And um, yeah, so they obviously go on to lose that game nine nil. And ahead of the Brazil game, there is the talk that they are being threatened by saying, if you lose, if you humiliate us again, you're, you're not coming, well, you are coming home and there will be consequences. So you're not allowed to lose by more than three or more than four goals, sorry. And um, so, yeah, they go into this game against Brazil and right at the start, uh, Jarzinho, I believe, gives Brazil the lead early on and everyone is worried. But then they put in a relatively decent performance to keep Brazil at bay. It's 1-0 at half time, considering they're 6-0 down at half time against Yugoslavia. Um, it's 1-0 at half time. Rivellino scores a brilliant goal to make it 2-0, hammers it into the top corner second half. And then the moment of infamy arrives where it's the free kick on the edge of the box that has been replayed countless times since that day. Um, Malupu, Mwepu Ilunga charges out of the wall at the free kick and lumps the ball upfield. And he is mocked and ridiculed as being, oh, these, these African guys, they don't know the rules of football. They're idiots and this, that and the other. Without knowing the story of the threats to not lose by X amount of goals. And... Um, yeah, and then Brazil do score a third eventually, but that's it. And it, apparently that is enough for the Zaire team to get away with not facing the wrath of um, Mobutu. But ultimately they were still punished when they went back because they were treated like pariahs. You see, this is why it's so wonderful to have Ibrahim Mustafa uh, with us, Tim. I mean... <laughs> We wouldn't have got this background uh, without somebody who wrote a book like No Longer Naive, African Football's Growing Impact on the World Cup. You don't get the kind of background that explains it because a lot of this has lived with me personally as a football fan for 57 years. You know, imagine that. Sorry, is it 57 years? It's 47 years. Imagine that, that a generation of African football fans have lived with the question mark about that World Cup 1974, and particularly that free kick, because we take our narrative, um, most of us, you know, Africans take our narrative from the Western narrative. So when people say, look at these Africans, let's show that free kick over and over and over and over and over again to show how naive these Africans are when it came to playing football. Or let's talk about the 9-0 defeat. You know, I'm not sure if that is a World Cup record. 9-0 defeat um, by Yugoslavia of Zaire. That's what we've had to live with. But now that you're explaining the background to this, I totally get it and feel for the Zaire and players. For one thing, what Tim observed in re-watching this match was exactly what I observed. Because I've been poisoned by the bias of the Western, um, you know, summing up of this match for so long, I didn't expect to see any Zaire and players who could play. I expected to come onto this podcast today and said, I should have made it into that squad. I was 14 at the time. I could have made it into that squad. Well, actually, the truth is I couldn't have because these players, um, they weren't as athletic, I didn't think, as the Brazilians in terms of football. The Brazilians were like half a pace ahead of them. But there were some times when they were 
passing and moving and dribbling around the Brazilians, you thought, hang on, they can actually... And Brazil, I don't know if you agree with this, Tim, Brazil is actually quite cautious and wary of... It, it, it feels like the Brazilian play is somewhat tentative. I mean, this free kick is um, a good example. A free kick that was rudimentary uh, for a Brazil of that quality. 1974, they're arguing over, you know, how far the Zion guys away from the ball and pushing them back and they're pushing them back and it becomes a scrap. What should be just like an ordinary free kick becomes a bit of a scrap. Well, they're, I they're think tense. They're, they're, they're tense. And yeah, remember, from, I, from, from, from the Brazil point of view, they've drawn their first two games nil-nil. Now that's very, very disappointing. And now they're up there, the overwhelming favourites. They're up against a team who've just conceded nine. And you only need three. You need three, you do it. And they ain't coming easily. You know, I mean, the, the first two goals, they're two goals from the great names, Jairzinho and, and, and Rivellino. And they are fantastic goals. That's what it's taking to break down this Zaire team. That on the ball, it, it was amazing to me watching that. Because again, you know, I had had that narrative. <laughs> they shouldn't have been there. They had every right to be there. They could play those th 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 those players, and uh, you know, so Brazil are really sweating on the third goal. And the third goal is unfortunate. It's the right winger, the substitute right winger, Valdomiro. It's a kind of cross come shot, really, and. It's a goalkeeping error fundamentally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hideous yeah, it's goalkeeping a, yeah. error. Mm. It's, it's it's a bit hard on a goalkeeper because it bounces, mm. and they're always yeah. more difficult. It's bit, and he's diving to his wrong side, mm. and, and it bounces through him. But if it wasn't for that, you know, they could have held Brazil at two nil, mm. which would have been a real, real problem. It would have meant, I think, the drawing of lots between. Scotland, yeah, yeah, Scotland and yeah. Brazil, because they would have had, yeah. they'd have had to identical records with Scotland, because Scotland I had them um, two. I think Scotland, Brazil, Scotland yeah. would have been all right, because Scotland mm. drew with Yugoslavia one-one. So I think that oh, they'd really? have been all right mm. on scoring more goals, where mm. everything else was nil-nil. So you know, th th they worried Brazil, and this mm. is a Brazil side that have got to go out and do it. You're you're full of great names, and and world champions, of course, as you said, world champions, yeah, yeah. And defending world champions. When I was watching that game. It, it totally changed my perspective on, on the Zaire team. Instead of jokers known for the free kick and conceding nine, it was, hang on a minute, you lot, you, you've shown something that you deserve to be there. And your plant, it's the first sub-Saharan African team there. It's not going to be easy, mm. but you're planting seeds for the future. Now, there hasn't been a future at World Cup level for the country that was Zaire. Yeah. But that's... we've seen sub Saharan Africa get their hint. I think I've expected more from the last few World Cups, but it's going to come one day, isn't it? Surely, Ibrahim, it's going to come one day. Yeah. I mean, I think we discussed it last time I was on and just um, trying to find that trying to get rid of all that, all the politics, you'd have thought by from 1974 and all the sort of background politics might have, they'd have finally learned something, but obviously it's still persisted over the years. Not, not necessarily strictly as I slash DR Congo, yeah. but just generally throughout Africa and the, the constant how, inter how the government interference. How do you feel about this? Mm. As sons of Africa, how do you two feel about this, con the constant tales of the kleptocracy? Well, that I I want to shift the narrative because I don't think like you, Tim. Well, when we talk about kings and queens uh, or British history, and everybody talks about kings and queens, you say, "What about everybody else? Everybody yeah. wasn't a king and queen." Exactly. It's about yeah. more than just a so the kleptocrats to do get theirs. Yeah. They'll get theirs because I, I I I believe that there will be a karma. There will be a day of reckoning, and. Uh, African youth will wake up and look and hold people to account and if not hold them to account then seize uh, the uh, the profits the wealth of their progeny which is still is used and is still stolen money but what it's really important to change the narrative because as we've said about this particular match you see I don't think that until 
you change the narrative of this particular match, we've, which we both alluded to, which is that this is, you know, let, let, let's laugh at these Africans until we change that narrative and shift it towards a narrative that tells a full picture in the way that Ibrahim has told it on this podcast. Until we shift that narrative, I don't think there will be an African team that wins the World Cup because this is where that issue of naive has its, its strongest potency. An African team, we've let you into the World Cup, you lose 9-0 against Yugoslavia, and then uh, you go and do some embarrassing moves during a game against Brazil. Until that narrative has been told correctly, until we rewrite that narrative, all of African football's World Cup um, experience is predicated on this opening round. And, you know, if the foundation is uh, incomplete, certainly in terms of narrative or arguably false, how can everything else that you build upon it be strong? I don't get that. I Ibrahim, you might have a different perspective. Um, I'm slightly more optimistic in that I feel that, the, I mean, you know, for the story of Zaire, the narrative hasn't been shifted from them. But I think... Ultimately, I think African football has gone some way to try and re repair that damage. Unfortunately, not. It, I mean, it's not all on African football to, to change the minds of how people think about their misinformation from the from the 1974 World Cup. But because we've it is had, down, it is down yeah. to African Africa, African football, Africans mm -hmm. to change that narrative. Though, yeah, yeah. I mean, but on the pitch. We've had obviously the success of Cameroon and then later Nigeria and then Senegal and things have been Ghana, more, Ghana of course. And it's been more positive in sort of the, sort of more modern contemporary times. And so, and have provided almost like an, an, uh, an antidote to that issue that took place in 1974, but ultimately that's still going to stick there. That's going to still be like a, it's going to be permanent, unfortunately, but... I'm not sure just, about that. I'm mm. not sure about that, Ibrahim. I'm, I'm the real optimist. I, I, I think the time is right now, you know, given the last year or two of Black Lives Matters, uh, given George Floyd, uh, given the sort of experience of Black, young Black England footballers at the Euros, etc. The time has come for us... Uh, to rewrite these stories and um, from an African perspective and make films about them, write books about them, do television. Because immediately, when, when you tell me this story now, you can imagine, and I'm sure many of the listeners that are listening are thinking, where are these Zairean footballers? Where are they today? How do they remember this story? The story you told us of the night before the... Um, uh, the Yugoslavia match, arguing about their money. I mean, that's a play in itself. I can see the play now. You know, 11 footballers sat around and there's one person missing, the guy with the money. And instead of going to sleep and getting a full night's sleep like every other footballer, they're worried about their future, their destiny, their legacy, securing the future of their family and so on. The night before a World Cup match, that's the truth of that match. And as far as the Brazil match is concerned, I'd like to speak to that footballer who kicked the ball away because he knew the game, he knew what it was. At first I thought, well, did he think that the Brazilian footballer had touched the ball first, you know, in the kind of like about to take the free kick? And then it sort of like, you know, fell apart. So he thought, oh, well, if they've touched the ball, I can kick it away. There is a story there in itself, which I don't doubt has a profound impact on social and political uh, situation of Zaire at the time. I, I would love to speak to that person. And I think until you get those people's stories, um, you can't fully understand it. We're not a naive continent. We're not a naive people. We never have been. Uh, 
FIFA started this, the conversation started today with you telling us, you and Tim telling us about the history of FIFA looking on Africans as like, well, we can't let them in. We can't let them in. They'll bring down the tone. Whoever heard of a tournament like that? Imagine the Olympics. Imagine the Olympics saying, well, we're not going to bring in, what's that country's name? Yeah, nobody knows that country. They're not going to win anything. That's that. This is a tournament, a world tournament, and you've already excluded an entire continent. It's shocking. It, it, it's amazing to me that the force of uh, of that word, naive, because I, my interpretation of what was really going on at that free kick is a bit of gamesmanship. It's shithousery. It's let, let's let's break down the rhythm of the game. Brazil are squabbling a little bit about taking this this, this free kick. Well, let's do, let's do something to piss them off a little bit. Let's do something just to you know. It, it's a, it's a it's a dramatic version of lying on the floor and, and and waiting for the trainer to come on. You know, I don't think it's naive at all. It, it's uh, it, it's almost the opposite. But well, you know, the word naive got got rolled out, and it got rolled out again for Cameroon in 1990. And one of the last things that Cameroon were, were naive, and they were downright violent at times. And if it moved, they kicked it, but they weren't naive. Um, but, you know, everything was seen through that prism. And I would venture that that prism is now weakening. Mm. That African teams and no sub-Saharan African teams aren't seen as automatically everything they do, regardless of whether it's whether it's gamesmanship or whatever, they're not automatically seen as naive, anything like the extent that they were 30 years ago. So in that sense, I think I'm, ag I'm agreeing with your optimism. Yeah. Um, so to go back to Dustin's point about um, Mwepo Ilunga, I mean, he unfortunately he passed in uh, 2015. So um, unfortunately you won't be able to get him on the podcast to explain his uh, reasoning. But he had but actually given... But he, we, um, we've we've got the budget to go mm. there where he is, but we just ain't got the budget to come back. That's Listen, the problem. I'll give um, you the budget to go there, Tim. Mm. Call the budget. You go there, and report back. Mm. Well, um, but be but before he did, but before he unfortunately died, he did actually give a couple. He had a couple of interviews to the BBC about um the incident because obviously somebody attracted him down to speak to him about it, and he did say that yeah, there was um. He it was almost in one interview he says it was definitely an act of rebellion. It was fundamentally it was again aimed at Mobutu to be like, well, again, I'm doing this as a way of humiliating you, not me. It's going to be on you. It's going to reflect badly on you and all the people who have taken our money that at the top of Zaire are going to be made to look foolish because the whole the whole name is being dragged through the mud here, and that's why I'm doing it. Because you see him after he um. He does it. He looks at the referee. The referee books him, and then he does this sort of sarcastic bow. He puts his arms out. So it's almost yes. what what Tim was saying about him, um, the, the gamesmanship idea, and the fact that you know naive is being rolled out to suggest that he didn't know what he was doing, but actually it was it was really calculated, you know. And he's he has um, mocked his he mocked the um, kick on throughout in his in his later career. He um, went on. Um, That's all right. You carry on. <laughs> he I went on. Um, you remember um, uh, the Badil and Skinner fantasy, fantasy football and how popular that was. And they did. They used to do this segment, Phoenix from the Flames, where they'd get players to recreate moments from their their careers. And they got him on it, and he did it, and did it, and laughed it. I played it for laughs. And he, I mean, again, and these are things that are you talking about the narrative and things like that. This hasn't spread enough that he actually knew what he was doing and he can take the piss out of himself for it later on in his career because it's just and not, it was, yeah. And yeah. it's a revolutionary act, you mm. know, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. If you accept him, and that's his um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, explanation, the fact that it was a revolutionary act, you see, that makes. That makes the sort of Western perspective of this even more absurd. Mm. What well, you can't tell a revolutionary act from naivety. Mm -hmm. The reason you well, can't they don't, tell... they don't want to. The fact is, exactly. it's easy. The narrative well, that exactly. the, 
a, a team that's just lost 9-0 and they're 3-0 down. It's just like, yeah, they, they're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. But again, like I say, this was a, an African powerhouse at the time. They'd won two AFCONs and, you know, you don't get there not knowing the rules of football. You don't qualify for a World Cup not knowing how to play football, do you? So regardless it's, of where you're from. It's like thinking that Les Dawson can't really play the piano. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's that's very how, much that's like that's that. A, yeah, that's how stupid it is. But it, it's, I think it's even more stupid than that because... All you needed to know uh, to know that Les Dawson plays the piano is to listen to him, mm. yeah? Because he used to play at the beginning of every programme or the end of every programme or the middle of every programme, he'd play a bit of piano. So all you need to know is listen to him. If you apply the same discipline of research uh, to finding out about where Zaire is, let's start with that mm. first of all, where is it? It's not just in Africa, mm. you know, an African team has made it. No, no, Central Africa has made it into the World Cup, if you like. Mm -hmm. But not only that, to understand where these people are coming from, the politics of the time, the dictatorship at the time. Can you imagine, can you imagine if it was a North Korean team? You know, there's a team with a, a big dictator, a North Korean team and they did something that you couldn't explain and you didn't reference Kim Jong-un. You, know, you didn't <laughs> reference the fact that uh, North Korea is a pariah state that is blasting off uh, nuclear missiles, ballistic missiles, left, right and centre, and it's a closed country. And, you know, who know you, how could you not do that? So this is the ultimate sports washing. This is why... We who are football fans or who are sports fans and people generally need to wake up to sports washing because the real uh, poison of sports washing is that those who are charged with reporting the facts take their narrative from the dictator. Or from Tarzan films. Where the white guy, yeah. the, the white guy is the king of the jungle. Mm. I remember when I was a kid watching Ali say that on Parkinson or something. I'm thinking, I never thought of that. It's brilliant. Yeah. I, I I had thought about that. We did wonder uh, all the years of Tarzan. Mm -hmm. Hey, how comes this white guy is king of the jungle? Yeah. We, did, we did. You see, that's white privilege. You never thought about that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I was I was nine. You know, so yeah. you know, cut me a little bit of slack. Matter. White privilege starts at an early age. You know <laughs> but this game, where should we put it then? In the annals of African football, Ibrahim. Um, because if we do, if we follow the narrative, first time a sub-Saharan team makes it to the World Cup, mm -hmm. that nar narrative only leads to an embarrassment, doesn't it? Yeah. It, yeah. Is, is it, is it mm -hmm. more, do you see glory. this as more steps forward or more steps mm -hmm. back? Mm -hmm. Well, it, the, the way I sort of try and pre present in the book is that this is the jumping off point for how people thought of African football teams and how everything that is almost almost everything that has happened since then shows it as an anomaly and as something that was clearly you know that it was it was not the norm for african teams to be like that basically or, or they shouldn't have been like that had another african team qualified that would not have happened basically so it's it, it shouldn't be perceived as a, an, an africa wide thing basically although like i say the problems behind the scenes unfortunately do sort of linger on and become part of the narrative of African football but it's not these things aren't just necessarily re restricted to Africa yeah it seems to happen a lot in Africa but are we are we to say that no football team in the world has ever had disputes over money before is there no sort of in influence that sort of goes on behind the scenes at other co at other countries that potentially qualifying for the world cup or just even at club level you know we see it all the time. We hear about it all the time. So it's not it's to present that as a specific African problem is a problem, basically. No, ab absolutely important point. So the game that we've been talking about, you know, the Brazilian shirt name podcast, we look at a an iconic game from some time in the history of football, and we deliberate that as we've done today. And uh, thank you, Ibrahim, because you've opened our eyes and ears up to a lot of information that suddenly 
informs us about this game. And it's worth watching now with the information that you've given us, as much of it as you can see. So it's the 22nd of June, 1974, Brazil versus Zaire, or Zaire versus Brazil, if you prefer, in the World Cup. Uh, ended up being 3-0 to Brazil, and they were able to progress. But, of course, uh, Zaire came bottom of... Uh, their group, as you would expect. We also, with the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, do look at the kind of cultural and social and political context of all these things, which I think we've done already. So there's no real need to look at the newspapers at the time because I think the actual story is in Zaire. So it would look a bit odd to look at the newspapers here and, you know, the, the, they wouldn't mention Zaire whatsoever. It's as far away from their reality as possible. But I think it's still worth looking at the, the songs in the pop charts, which is another thing that we do on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Look at the soundtrack of the times, partly because the World Cup is universal, it's global. It's not necessarily just about uh, Zaire, but also partly because of the dominance of, let's face it, the English or British pop charts on everybody else. And when we look at that, um, number one is the artist whose name cannot be mentioned or perhaps should not be mentioned. Um, do, do you want to mention him, Tim? You, you might want to mention that. Yeah, it's a historical fact. You can't yeah. airbrush Gary Glitter out of history. He was yeah. he he was number one. What whatever whatever else he is, yeah, terrific. He was uh, he was a big star. Well, would we be saying? Would you be saying it like that if it was, let's say, Adolf Hitler at number one? Well, I don't think he was a recording artist, was he? he was a he was a no, mediocre, no, it, a mediocre well, painter. No, no, <laughs> very mediocre. <laughs> I've forgotten about that, but <laughs> clearly you've read his book, <laughs> and um, but sometimes even if you're not a pop artist you know the the recorded works of tony ben can make it into the pop charts you know his political work or whatever but the point i'm trying to make is there will be people listening to this podcast who might have been affected by the crimes of gary glitter and i'd feel a bit awkward and particularly as you're putting him at number one but you're right it's a historical fact uh, Gary Glitter, and I feel cheated by him. Uh, this I, is I don't, my... See, I don't agree with airbrushing Air... pe people out, out of history. Now, people got very confused with the idea of throwing statues into the sea, that they were being airbrushed out of history. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. In no way were they being airbrushed out of history. But when you put someone on a statue, you are expressing approval of this person. I will not suggest that anyone should go around making a statue of Gary Glitter. If yeah. there is a statue of Gary Glitter, or Paul Gadd, <laughs> as I think his real name is, I think yeah, it yeah. should be thrown into the bottom of the sea. It but will be. Just as, as uh, uh, the people who, whose, whose statues are now at the bottom of the sea, just as they had a historical contribution that we would judge as overwhelmingly negative, so Gary Glitter had a contribution to cultural life in uh, in, in the early 70s. Uh, and I, I don't think you can airbrush it out. No, um, and Ibrahim, I'm, I'm happy for you to come into the conversation. Let me just make this point, though. Tim, you have argued my point exactly, because you're right. And by the way, Edward Colston's statue in Bristol was thrown into the river, and it's been reclaimed out of the river, but it's no longer on public display. It's no longer on public display. That's a different kind of thing than a pop chart, which is an ethereal thing, but exists for statistical or historical record. I'm not trying to airbrush Gary Glitter out. I grew up. I grew up with Gary Glitter. And that's why I feel very cheated by him, that mm -hmm. all the time we were growing up, you were committing these crimes in full view. And we should have known, but we didn't or we arguably, I, I was a young man, I was like 12, 13 years old. You want to be my gang, my mm. gang? Yeah, I said, yeah, I want to be in your Why not? Mm. It's rock and roll, I like 50s rock and roll. However, I'm not going to stand up and say, I loved Gary Glitter. I'm not going to, because I don't think that helps the people who particularly are the victims. And to see him at the top of the pop charts, is actually an indictment on the society that we 
live in. I agree with you. He's in the pop charts. If he was number 10, it wouldn't make me feel so awkward. I just think Alba is a pop star. But to have that person at the top of the pop charts, at the top of all the other artists that are trying to show their talents, it's hard to swallow. I don't know. I think more from, I mean, because um, I was not, I, was, I don't think my parents had even met in 1974. Um, so, um, yeah, I was not born. But sort of from a more contemporary point of view, um, we have currently, I mean, the best way I can relate this is someone like R. Kelly, who I grew up listening to and, you know, fundamentally adored his music and everyone. He, he had produced and written for so many other people within that sort of like R&B sort of circle within the sort of like 90s 2000s and um yeah and it's not airbrushing them out of history per se to um decide not to listen to their music anymore not glorify their music anymore but it's it's that that reminder that sort of sits there and just says that you know these people have been able to do something that is like you say, you like you say, you felt let down, Dotson. It's like you know to hoodwink people with what you would con- considered at the time perhaps brilliant work, but the behind that there's something so much more sinister going on that in that in that when you become aware of it, it 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 completely blots anything that may have been good, so to speak, that they've done. Yeah, yeah. do you know the other aspect of this? I think you're absolutely right, Ibrahim. The other aspect of this is um, there's a couple of points I'll make very quickly, if I may. The other aspect of this, Tim, let's not forget, is that this person used his music, which was aimed at kids, as a way of grooming children. Young girls were hanging around him because he had said, do you want to be in my gang, my gang, my gang? And then when he went on tour to Australia and came back, he said, did you miss me? Yeah, when I was away and all that. He was using his music the same way as, you know, we were warned to stay away from people that offered you sweets and that kind of thing, children. That's what he did. And that's what sticks in the gullet a lot. Anyway, look, um, the other point I want to make very quickly, Ibrahim mentioned R. Kelly there, which is the current uh, equivalent. And somebody said to me, before the R. Kelly conviction, and I was wondering, will his music ever be played on the radio again? And somebody compared Gary Glitter to Michael Jackson. There is no argument in the broadcasting world that Gary Glitter's music is not played. There's no argument. Whereas there is an ongoing argument that will continue for the next hundred years as to whether you should play Michael Jackson or not. And somebody pointed out to me, yeah, the difference is Gary Glitter's music is shit. So <laughs> oh, yeah. You yeah can forget that. that. Yeah. We, so, we sorry. Forget that. I know we're talking about very serious yeah. subjects, but yeah, that is. Uh, but Michael yeah. <laughs> Jackson's music is more problematic mm. to sort of dispatch with. Mm. And R. Kelly's falls in between those gaps. I mean, uh, I think I Believe I Can Fly is a song that arguably is goes beyond R. Kelly. You know, it's one of those, uh, I don't know how you describe it, those, um, you know, huge songs that seem to be in the public psyche. It's going to be difficult to play him now, but I wonder in 20 years' time whether people say, oh, yeah, it's been a while, you can play I Believe I Can Fly now. Mm-hmm. That is really the the cutting off point. Is music shit or not? Talking of music being shit or not. Oh, a quick, to... quick, quick one. When you're talking about statues, there, I've just discovered as as we're speaking that apparently that there a statue of Joseph Mobutu is being erected in uh, Kinshasa. How very strange. Well, maybe they also think it's part of their history that they can't avoid. And you know, Congo is a very, very young population. It's a very young population, something like 50% of the population is under about the age of, I think it might be about 23, 24 or thereabouts. So what they know of Mobutu, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, isn't the full story. Yeah. And, you know, these people have a tendency, if 
if everything else is falling apart. And that's that was one of the uh, anecdotes I wanted to mention when we were talking about, uh, when you were talking, Ibrahim, about the way that the um, Zaire and team fell apart before that Yugoslavia match. <laughs> I immediately thought of Chinua Achebe. Did he not say that mm, things would things fall, fall apart? Mm. And we know that things fall apart. <laughs> and particularly when things fall apart, you might look back on another period in your life as not being as bad as you thought it was. You know, there's always been this thing, hasn't there? You know, you, you have a right wing dictatorship and then you think, oh, for goodness sake, bring in communism. But then when you have the sort of anarchy that you've got, which is still where the Congolese state is at the moment. You just think, oh God, the, uh, bring back, please bring back Mobutu. At least when Mobutu was here, the trains ran on time or whatever it might be, you know? And I've seen, you might have seen it yourself. I remember at the end of the Liberian civil war, I have a Liberian or Sierra Leonean civil war, um, you know, going back 20 years ago. And I remember seeing this uh, BBC TV footage with people in Sierra Leone saying, bring back British colonialism mm. because they've just been through hell, mm. you know? <laughs> I, can, I can kind of, it's shocking, but it's, it's, I kind of understand that. Should you look at the rest of the charts? Anything else caught your eye in this, Ibrahim? You're the youngster. Um, no, this is it. This is... um. Yeah, this is a quite, uh, I mean, uh, producer Mark sent me over the list and I was going through it and I was like, I know these people, but I don't really know these songs. I mean, there's very few songs I'm actually uh, familiar with here. Summer Breeze, um, uh, Isley Brothers. Isley Brothers, yeah. Yeah, yeah quite enjoyed. Yeah, mm, yeah it's an yeah. absolute classic and uh, still just works to this day. Mm. The three younger ones join the three original Isleys. I think, I think the album was called Three Plus Three. Mm. Uh, and they just take it up to a, you know, there's a Jimi Hendrix influence there in what the True. Isleys would do. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. Hmm. What about the freak, Ray Stevens, uh, at yeah. number two the in the chart? Yeah. Sorry, the streak. Yeah, apologies. The streak at number two, uh, Ray Stevens. Well, it's, it's a novelty well, record, isn't it? There's, there's, there's but, a few novelties around. But isn't that the. Uh, I was going to say, isn't that sort of like the, you know, like Weird Al Yankovic, sort of the predecessor to that, sort of that yeah, sort of. Um, yeah. You know, like you say, novelty record, sort of like a bit, of, a, I guess, a satire parody. What, what are we calling it? You know, it's a, yeah. a piss yeah, take, you're basically. Right. Yeah. But do, do you know what a streak is? Is, is he talking about streakers, though, isn't he? That, you yes, know, he is. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So your generation knows what a streaker yeah. is. <laughs> yes, I'm no, no, I, I just is, didn't yeah. know. Because <laughs> as much as Weird Al Yankovic did, you know, eat it to Michael Jackson's beat it or whatever mm. and all those other ones that was just throwaway stuff Ray yeah. Stevens here yeah, was a country artist I think mm. you remember um what he does in this song is trigger an absolute worldwide craze I think it happened in America already a craze of people throwing their clothes off and running through the streets in public yeah, it California happened. has a climate for it, you know. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Yeah. I, and the politics as well. And also it's got the weed for it as well, because you need to be stoned out of your head <laughs> to do something like this. I saw it once, you know. I saw it on Stroud Green Road, London <laughs> N4, just before you're coming up to Kisery Park. We were going from one party to another in the middle of the, It couldn't have been in the middle of the night because this guy ran out of a pub. So in those days, pubs shut at 11. So it would have been, you know, close to 11, maybe 10.30 on a Saturday evening and the, the road was almost empty so you couldn't understand why is he doing this suddenly out of nowhere this guy just ran past us completely naked and that was the only time I actually saw a streaker in real life I felt like I'd been violated but I, I, I kept laughing for ages and ages and ages uh, well when you see somebody's crack close mm. up there's not much else you can do <laughs> <laughs> Laugh, <mate. laughs> you know, yeah, disappearing in the distance I mean, don't get me wrong it wasn't like I was observing it I didn't pull out a microscope or whatever to study it for posterity although having said that posterity is probably the right word <laughs> um, oh, yeah, well, um, I'm full of them tonight yeah. but um I was going to say yeah. novelty records. You've got, I, I noticed there are three Wombles songs in yeah. the, the charts. And I didn't realize the Wombles were like a band. I, when I was a kid, it was, it was Mike you know, Underground, Overground. It was just the song. That's what we yeah. thought. And, you know, but we didn't realize, I didn't realize how bad. They played at Glastonbury, apparently, according to, you know, 
the internet. <laughs> yeah, where well, everybody plays at Glastonbury, not on the main stage though. No, <laughs> not on the main stage. Well, they could have been. They could have been huge. Mm. And like uh, Tim says, it's um, uh, uh, a singer songwriter called Mike Bat. Mm. He was the Wombles, and uh, there's a uh, urban myth to suggest that he was the son of Hattie Jakes, the Carry On comedian. Oh, I, I interviewed it. Mike Bat. Yeah, then it was an urban myth, and I interviewed Mike Bat, and I said, "Yeah, what about your mum, Hattie Jakes?" Oh, for goodness sake! You're not another <laughs> one, are you? Well, not another one is falling for that. I don't know who Hattie Jakes. Never met her in my life. She said, "Not my mum." So, at number three, Shawadi Wadi. Hey, hey, rock and roll. Rock and roll. The fifties um, never go away, do they? There's the you know, fifties are always there. I think they've got away now, though. To be honest, yeah, I think they've gone away now. You know, I'm not sure. I think in these days, we're only twenty years away from the fifties. Arguably, in the early seventies, nineteen seventy-four, you're, you're, you're fifteen argue, years away. Yeah, yeah, fifteen years away from the nineteen fifties, and um, it wasn't that far away. You know, and also we didn't have TV uh, constantly showing us how shit it was in the 50s <laughs> and how much better it is today you know that's true it's part of I've, the, I've, I've got yeah. i've got mixed feelings about the 70s because in many ways they're a great time in many ways i mean they're the time when britain was at its most egalitarian uh, which is why they've got such a bad name because the elite never you know he wants to take us back to the 70s fuck yeah yeah, you know, I remember during the seventies, my family and my dad was like forty-five when we got into the seventies. You know, for the first time in the seventies, I remember getting a TV and getting a fridge and getting a washing machine, mm -hmm. uh, um, a, a phone, and a and a fourth-hand Czechoslovakian car. I think you had to wait till the eight, till <laughs> the eighties. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had a um, guinea pig, and it was a flat. But and it took him a long time to get out of the car and come up and I get in the flat. But the guinea pig managed to associate the sound of the car with my dad arriving, you know, because it but 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 and the guinea pig was clever enough to think, oh yeah, if it's making that noise outside, that means in a, in about two minutes, my, two minutes he's he's, he's going to arrive. So the guinea pig will go squeaking. So that they and they were a time the seventies when a lot of the the triumphs, the gains of the sixties were being spread across a wider section of the public. You know, th th there's an element to the 60s that was a kind of Chelsea set having a ball. And in the 70s, that, that, that's going wider. There's more people who are, who are able to gain some choice of freedom around how, how they run their lives. So there's, I think there's, there's loads to admire about the 70s. But on the other hand, I mean, where, where I, I, I look at the 60s as a lot of people acquiring taste for the first time. It's the first time you can spend money on clothes and you can acquire taste. And I look at the early 70s and then this time as just a gleeful parade of bad taste. Everyone looks like an idiot. Like all of them look like an idiot. They're, they, are, they are loudly proclaiming how tasteless they are. And I've never really understood that side of the uh, 70s. This is the glam rock era, though. Tim, that's unfair that they look terrible. Obviously... <clears throat> when you follow they look fashion, like idiots. Probably, yeah, they do. But when you follow fashion, when you're dedicated, to follow fashion is temporary, isn't it? Um, yeah. Class or um, class and style are permanent. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, uh, that's exactly what it is. I, I was thinking more um, that couture is permanent. Fashion is throw away, but couture, the real sort of art of making clothes is much more permanent. And this was a glam rock era. So you've got people like, you know, the Rubettes in the charts with, they're number 11, are they, or somewhere around there, with yeah. Sugar Baby Love. I you saw see, them do that I, live once. And yeah, I thought, yeah. it's not, that they could sing, they could harmonise. I thought it was yeah. too produced. Because yeah. in well, the production, you lose how good, how much there is a debt to kind of do what harmonies in there. True. It was true. overproduced. Yeah, but you see, I'm wondering why you're going on about their clothes, why you should be going on about the shit music that they're putting out. Because Rubets, like you say, are a decent band, but they're doing this sort of like really sugary, uh, toe-curling, uh, talk about bubblegum pop. Oh, my goodness. You may as well be singing to five-year-olds. Sugar baby love. 
Sugar, who calls their other half Sugar Baby Love? <laughs> I was there in the 1970s, mate. Nobody, I have, I would never, <laughs> Sugar Baby Love, trust me, it's, it's for five-year-olds, this music. Brian Ferry's in there. Uh, which is good to see. Yeah, it's Although, a dreadful version of a great yeah, song. Yeah, I was about to say. I was about to say. I was about to say. <laughs> no, you're right. As Dobie Gray sings, you know, the originals are still the greatest. Mm. There, 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 exactly. <laughs> there are some songs that, you know, there's a reason why nobody else has covered it. And uh, Brian Ferry hasn't quite learned that lesson. Overall, though, what did you, your youngster head make of this chart? Ibrahim, given you haven't got a clue what me and Tim are talking about uh, when we talk about glam rock and I this, felt, I felt, I mean, you've got Bowie in there. Uh, we talk yeah, yeah. About, yeah, he's up there, but he's got, I don't know, it just seems like, again, like I was saying, I, I'm familiar with so many of the names, but not the songs. I don't know, was it just a fallow period for all these artists making the songs oh, that you're, just you're weren't? Saying, yeah. You're saying the songs are all shit? I'm not saying they're shit, shit. Just, uh, just generally not their best songs. I mean, David yeah. Bowie's got Diamond Dogs, and it's definitely not the best of any. You wouldn't, no one's putting Diamond Dogs on their top ten Bowie's tracks, are they? Sure, sure. You know, I didn't like so, that. Um, album I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, and that's got that's the uh, you know I looked up it had that's the one it's got Rebel Rebel on it, which is again not great, but much better than Diamond Dogs, I guess. Oh, um, I, I like Rebel Rebel actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like Rebel Rebel, Rebel and I don't understand why Bowie's been canonized. I like Rebel Rebel. Mm, there are okay. some great songs on Wall Street Shuffle by 10CC is really clever. It's a great song. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a great song, but like Ibrahim says, it's not their you know best no, or it's even, not, it's not their arguably best. certainly not their biggest. But that's one of the uh, innocuous, well, not innocuous, but that was one of the songs that got by. Did, oh, mm. God, didn't quite make it. Oh, a young girl, fact. Gary Puckett. Great song. I remember that. Yeah, Gary Puckett. Wasn't he the Union Gap one? That's the, that's the one, yeah. yeah. yeah that might yeah. have been a reissue, as yeah. Ghost in My House by Ardeen Taylor was the reissue. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, one song I do remember, which certainly was reissued much later, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, Elton John. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I was obviously more familiar with the, the version he did with George Michael, mm -hmm. and um, I wasn't aware that he was actually released this, so, this, this early in his career. I don't. I don't, as I remember this song, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, this wasn't a Elton John original. It was Nick Kershaw that wrote it. Am I right? Because I no, remember Nick, Nick, Nick Kershaw's many, many years afterwards. Oh, so years after this. Because yeah. I, I seem I seem to think that he did a version of this song. No, he did well. a song of the same name, but a very different song. Mm. Oh, is it different? <laughs> no, I made that it's kind of it's again. horrible synth pop. Whereas yeah. you know, the, El the Elton it's, it's, it's not the same one. It's no, it's not the same one. Oh, no, <laughs> I don't really understand. I mean, Elton John, it's kind of contaminated for me by that seventies bad taste because he's grown up listening to great stuff, and there's talent there. Actually, I don't mind this song. I think it's, a, but yeah. there's a lot of schlock that he came out with, isn't it? I don't, I don't really like much that that he did. I, it was I, a I, difficult I, one for Elton because remember uh, he it's, broke seventies singer singer songwriter schlock. Whereas, had he been re recording 10 years earlier, he'd, he'd have done good stuff. He was the most popular session musician amongst the pop stars of his day in terms of playing the keyboards. You know, he, he played keyboards for uh, Mark Bolan and all these sort of things. The Who, I think he did something with before he became Pinball Wizard. Several other, they, they always went for Elton John. He was like on the cusp of being a pop star, but he actually hadn't made it. So he was riding on the coattails of other people who had made it as their session musician. Then he went to tour in the States. He, he got new management. They said, well, what you've got to do is work hard and go and play thousands and thousands of clubs right across this vast continent called North America. And he went and did that and broke through to an extent. That so just fucks everyone up, doesn't it? Because you end exactly, up playing arenas. Exactly. Bollocks. Well, Bollocks. it's not just the arenas. It's not just the arenas. Remember, you're an English person with a brilliant poet as your lyricist, but actually your audience is America and you're trying to balance the American audience with the English audience at the time. In a stadium. It, 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 stadium comes afterwards. But I think just at the time, look, the only the re real representative of the United States in this chart, in the glam rock days, glam rock was a genre that we here in Britain had created. Yeah, Americans struggled to get in there. It, it's, too, it, it's too camp. 
isn't it, it for is. mainstream America? Which I, I know that the one you're going to pick out, which is the American version, which is Sparks. Mm, yeah, that's a good Started one. Started big enough for the both of us. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. The one. That, that that takes me back to being it, it, in the living room in 1974 with Top of the Pops on, because that's the one that sent my dad absolutely spare. You know, that's the one. <laughs> that's the cut-off point. Yes. Because yeah, it, it's so furiously camp, isn't it? And so yeah. much of glam rock. I, d- I, I didn't know it was camp. camp. We, we just looked at the the piano guy that hardly ever uh, moved his head and had a moustache, again, like Adolf Hitler. And we just thought, what's his story, mate? Are they really brothers? They look so different from each other. You know? The other one is the kind of brother you wouldn't take out of an evening because, you know, people would just be asking, you know, is that, is that Adolf or not? And that kind of thing. Well, anyway, it's a half decent chart. It's not the best of the glam rock era. Um, do you wish you were you were around in those days, Ibrahim, 1974, from what you've heard and seen? Yes, I guess. It does look quite fun. I mean, you know, I think it's probably been dressed up for television and things like that. But, yeah, you know, when I watch TV programmes from the 70s, I do think, yeah, it's been all right to be around right then. There yeah, was lots, there was well. lots yeah. going on. It, it was culturally mm. very, very effervescent in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, you'd have spent a lot of time running from the cops in those days. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> did, you, did you spend a long time running from the Babylon? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's not talk about what I had to do. They're, they're still looking for me. They're still running after me. 